Tony Broom Ministries now brings to you the following teaching session from God's Anointed Word. The book of Colossians is a wonderful book in God's Word, foundational to teachings in the New Testament because it presents to us Jesus Christ, the importance of being rooted and grounded and established in Him. This session is entitled, Be Established in Christ. His word lives forever. The scripture said the word of the Lord endures forever. And the grass fades, the flower fades away, but the word of our God will endure forever. It will never pass away. And we have a word today. We have a word from Colossians chapter 2. And the title of our session is Be Established in Christ. It is of utmost importance that we be established in Christ. You can't just say, well, I know about Him, or I visit Him on Easter Sunday, or I come on Christmas. And people have asked preachers, well, how do you feel about people who come on Easter Sunday or come on Christmas? And the wise answer to that is, I thank God for they come anytime they come. So that's a good way to look at it. But as far as a personal relationship with God, you can't just visit in every once in a while. You've got to have a personal relationship with God. Amen. You've got to know God, and you have to be established in Christ. To be established in Christ is of utmost importance. It's not a hit and miss thing. Our golden text is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him. To receive Him. And I know that the expression is that we accept Christ as our Savior. We do accept Him and what He did. But when you receive Him, one old pastor said, you can accept a million dollars, but you don't have it. But when you receive it, you got it. And that's the way it is about Jesus. You can accept the fact that Jesus is a good man or He's a teacher. But when you receive Him, you got Him. You know Him. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. That is, just walk on out your Christian faith. Keep on walking and be rooted and built up in Him. This gives us a focus, really, of this whole chapter and what it's about, being established in Christ. And the first section, be rooted in the faith. For something to be rooted is to be planted and to be firm, to have a foundation. In verses 6 through 12, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I talked in my devotion that I sent out an email this week about the faith tree. There are three stages of the faith tree. You have the planting stage, you have the progress or promoting or growth stage, and then you have the production stage, the fruit. A tree has to be planted, it has to be rooted, and then it has to grow, and then it has to produce fruit. And this is what he's talking about here. Be rooted in faith. Be established in Christ. Receive Christ. Be rooted in Him. And then be built up in Him. To be built up means to grow, to become strong. Be established in the faith. To the place and point where you can not only just barely make it, and that song that our sister sings, more than anything in my life, I've got to make it. Everybody enjoys that song. I'm not saying anything against that song. I play it for all the time. But really, doctrinally, scripturally, it's more than just making it. God wants you to do more than just make it. He wants you to be blessed abundantly. Amen. He wants you to prosper you say, well, we prosperity gospel. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But he does have prosperity in the gospel because God is a God of blessing. He's a God of prosperity. 
Prosperity doesn't necessarily mean spirituality, but neither does poverty. Just because you're poor, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're spiritual. You can be poor and be a poor sinner. <laughs> you can be mad and be poor. A lot of people who are poor are begrudging others for what they have. Some people think, for instance, that this person is blind. Oh, he must be close to the Lord. Well, if being blind is close to the Lord, we ought to all be blind then. That's right, that's right. Blindness doesn't make you any more close to the Lord than anything else. That's right. Matter of fact, it makes some many of my colleagues, many of my buddies who are blind, it actually makes them further away from God. The devil uses that to make them further away from God. They curse God. and They're against God. They blame God for their disability. They blame God for the things that happened to them in their life. So if we think about these, some of these things making us close to God, it doesn't make sense. Paul is teaching us to be established in Christ, to be receiving Him and to be rooted in Him, to be built up and established in Him, abounding therein as you have been taught with thanksgiving. Instead of grumbling and complaining, we have every right to give praise and thanks to God. God is a good God, and He has blessed us abundantly. We all today have a place to stay, and we have food to eat, and there's a nice facility that we can come in and worship God and be comfortable, sometimes almost too comfortable. I think it's... Uh, Siberian weather in the summertime, you know. But God has given us so much, and He's blessed us. And we have every right to thank God. And even if He never blessed us again, just by letting us know Him, have a relationship with Him, and be established in the faith, is more than we would ever deserve. And we have so much to be thankful for. And He continues by saying... Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We have to beware that we do not become sidetracked and spoiled by vain philosophy. To allow people to second guess and question what the Bible says and I saw you in that Pentecostal church and you was doing the Watusi for Jesus and you were dancing or you were talking in tongues. I heard you talking in tongues. And they start making you second guess whether it's really real or not. Don't allow people to put you down for your faith or put you down for your worship. People can get on TV and get out there and they can do anything they want to now. You better not say anything against them. They'll have you up for discrimination. But they can put Christians down all day long and it's all right to do that. Wait a minute now, let's give each other some slack. If you don't want me to put you down for your false God, don't put me down for the only true and living God. Amen. Don't allow people to deceive you and to discourage you by these faults and philosophy. Some of this philosophical stuff, it sounds good, it sounds big. Some of it sounds really wild, too. It's really way out there. You make fun of a person for having faith in Christ and believing in a God who you've never seen and giving money to a church and giving tithes to God, you've never seen Him, never shaken His hand or anything like that. And yet, they have these wild things that all these things you wouldn't even hardly can fathom and come up with the way people believe now. Christ. Christ is all all in all. The hymn said when morning gills the skies, my heart awakening cry, let Jesus Christ be praised. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When you take a look at Jesus you can see the Father, you can see the Son, you can see the Holy Ghost, you can see all three in one. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He brings it all together. Christ is the nucleus. He is the focus of the Godhead. He is the focal point of the Trinity. The Father who is absolutely above all and more powerful, He initiated all this 
and the Father, who is the most neglected person in the Trinity, by the way, the Father is. He is the one who started all this, if you will. And he didn't start it without the Son and without the Spirit, but all working together. But we have problem knowing who the Father is and even who the Spirit is by themselves. But Jesus brings it all together. Through him we can understand the Father. We can understand the Spirit. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Him walking around here on this earth, the shores of Galilee and other places he went, that was all God walking around in a body just like you and I. All God, yet all man. And Christ in him right now dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in Christ. There are more experiences in the Christian life than salvation or conversion. You have many experiences in life. Some of them are named and some of them are not. Sanctification, that's an experience. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, that's an experience. And a lot of blessings in the Christian life have experiences. But there are so many people who are dissatisfied. They're unsatisfied. They say they love Christ and they say they have a relationship with Him, but they keep looking for something else. They're never satisfied in their Christian life. Now, we shouldn't be saved and satisfied like preachers say. You just get saved and satisfied and you sit down and don't do anything. That's not what he's talking about. But we should be satisfied in our Christian life to the point that we're not constantly looking for something else. We're not constantly, there's got to be a better church. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better, and you're always just searching. If you know Jesus, you are born again. If you know that you're born again, and some people have a problem coming to that conclusion that they're born again. If you know that you're born again, you are satisfied in your relationship with Christ. You're not constantly looking for something else. He is the head of all principality and power. You're complete in Him, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now the Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham, this is my covenant between you and I and your descendants after you that would be a covenant of circumcision. All your males were to be circumcised and that would show the covenant between me and between you all. The covenant. And Paul says here that you are circumcised not with the circumcision made with hands of a Judeo religion or Judaism. You're circumcised with the circumcision without hands. This is a spiritual thing. Cutting away, doing away with the sins of the flesh. And the body of Jesus Christ, the circumcision of Christ made without hands. You're buried with Him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. When Jesus died on that cross, he died for us. And now that we're saved, when he died, we died. But when he rose, we rose with him. It's the resurrection. You are buried with him in baptism. Baptism, as you know, when a person's baptized... The preacher or the helpers that he has, whoever it is, they take this person down into the water and they bring the person back up out of the water. Well, this signifies that the old person has died. We are buried with him in baptism. That's like when you go down and then when you come back up, you're to walk in newness of life. That is what the Christian life is to be all about, is a new life. When you come up out of that water, and I know that baptism in itself is just a symbol, what it really represents, but when you come up out of that water, it represents the resurrection. Up from the grave he arose. He rose up from that grave. And we are to be in that sense in the Christian life. We're to be rooted in faith. 
to be rooted if you plant a strong tree and you want a strong tree and we want to be strong for the Lord I want to be a strong tree for Jesus I want to be strong I want to be tall but if you don't have roots you're going to topple over first big gust of wind will blow you over and that's the way it is when you're not rooted and grounded and you notice that I didn't say and I love the Pentecostal religion or Pentecostal church but you're not to be grounded in the Pentecostal church or the Baptist church or the Methodist church you're to be grounded in Christ because many people are grounded in what they call the church and everything goes well as long as the church does all right but when the church ceases to be doing all right everything they have their whole religion falls apart because that's all they have is religion but when we are grounded in Christ even if a church doesn't do so well even if the church in the true church will not but even if the church that you're talking about the church in general if they turn their back on God altogether it's still not going to bother you because you're walking not in, with the church you're walking with Jesus and if you're right with Jesus you're right with the real church if you're right with Jesus you'll have no problems having fellowship with the church because Jesus is the head of the church affirm your life with Christ affirm that means to make sure you know that you receive Christ but you make that thing solid you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses this says and reminds us of what he did for us when we were dead in our sins and our trespasses he quickened us that means he brought us in life he gave us life he quickened us together with Christ, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. He forgave us of all of our sins. That's enough to make you happy. When you really know that your sins are forgiven, it doesn't matter what they say that you used to do or what you used to be. What matters is who you are now in Jesus Christ. He has forgiven you of all your sins. And he took those sins and he washed them away. He did away with them. He has forgiven you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The law. Paul said there's nothing wrong with the law in itself. But you know what is wrong with the law? The law had to be crucified. I never thought about that before God showed me that this week. The law had to be crucified. Oh, you say, yeah, the law. There's Ten Commandments. They're still in effect. Sure they are. They'll always keep this world in bondage as long as they are living in sin. The law, I fought the law and the uh, law won. <laughs> And it will. It will always win. Every time you try to fight the law, it's just like your mom and daddy. You just try to get away from them and they put a gotcha hold on you. No way you could get away. And that's the way it is with the law. You try to fight and kick against the law, against a prick. Paul did that. There was no way he could win. He was a Pharisee. He was blameless in the law. He said as far as his religion was concerned. But nobody could keep that law perfectly and completely except Jesus Christ. It was always against you. The law was living as long as you were doing your living. But the moment you quit living, you quit doing, you quit living as far as the law was concerned. And he took that handwriting that was against us said you shouldn't have stole it but you did you shouldn't have lied but you did you shouldn't have disobeyed your parents but you did and all that law that was against you that was contrary to us he took it out of the way of nailing it to his cross the law had to be crucified this is how we can affirm our life with Jesus Christ we cannot do it by the law no flesh is justified by the law you have to come to a law that's been crucified and a Savior that's been justified that's in the Spirit that's been risen from the dead, has been raised, and that's who He is. Having spoiled principalities and powers, 
He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That cross that day was our Statue of Liberty. That cross, he triumphed over principalities. He triumphed over powers. He triumphed over all the power of the evil one. And he made a show. Some translations say spectacle. He made a spectacle of them. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it's the power of God. And glory to God, he triumphed over all evil on that cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. We're not, again, to allow ourselves to be deceived, to be strangled, to be lassoed by the things of this world and people who try to bring us in bondage and try to make us like them because if people can make us like them then they'll have followers and they'll have a group after them jesus didn't come into this world and i mean this in the right way but he didn't come into this world just to make people after him he came to do it in the right way he didn't come to overthrow the roman government he didn't come to set up a kingdom then he came to save people and that's how you become like christ it's not through some church, it's not through some organization, it's not through some society, secret, religion. You come and become more like Christ by being in the family of God. When you're born again, He begins to make you like Him. And you begin to affirm your life in Him. Don't let people judge you as sabbath days nobody kept it perfectly the sabbath day is fulfilled in jesus christ and i believe that we should still have a day out of seven that we take aside from secular employment i know sometimes you can't do that now but we should have that day god does it so we can have rest he does it so that we can worship and have a place that we could come and worship together, spend time with our family. You know how it was when you were coming up and you had the blue laws in effect and the businesses were closed on Sunday. And Sunday is the Lord's day. But even Sunday is not the Sabbath day. We call it the Sabbath as Christians, but actually the Sabbath day is Saturday. So if we try to impose Sunday laws on Saturday or Saturday laws on Sunday, it just doesn't work. The big thing to do is to serve Jesus Christ every day. And if you have the opportunity to observe the Lord's day like we still do, then by all means you should do that. It is amazing to me how when Dr. Creech was here a couple of years ago, he came in the sanctuary. There wasn't but a few of us here on Sunday evening because he had the dinner theater. And I, I'm not speaking against the dinner theater, but it was funny because he came in and he did a fantastic message about the Sabbath day and our observance of Sunday, still honoring God on his day. He did a fantastic message on it. And I'm thinking, man, this is a wonderful message, but yet you got all this other stuff going on on campus at the same time. So we still can affirm our life with Christ. And as we're doing that, we have to reject what is called man-made religion. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. People can get things in their own mind and think that God said so and so and God hadn't said anything. God told me to tell you this. Well, he wants me to know bad enough he'll tell me himself. Some of these things, and I know we ought to listen to the prophet. The Old Testament says listen to the prophet. But Jesus is the prophet. Now, we listen to the prophet. Jesus is the prophet. Are there prophets in the church? Sure there are. God puts apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. But some of these things, again, that people come up with, 
worshiping of angels and rubbing statues and all these ritualistic things. Don't get involved in all that. Don't let anybody beguile you of your reward. Don't let them seduce you and take away your reward. Getting into things that they really don't know what they're talking about. They're vainly puffed up by their fleshly mind and not holding the head. The real head, if you hold on to the head, you are not going to go wrong throughout the body. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands or ligaments, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. As long as you stay focused on the head, as long as you stay connected to the head, you're all right. But the moment you get your focus off the head, you become a disaster. The body cannot live without the head. And Jesus is the head. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Going back under this man-made religion, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Don't allow yourself to be involved and get in bondage in man-made religion. Trying to be good enough. None of us will be good enough. Jesus is the only one who is good enough. And we serve Him and we focus on Him. Quit trying to be good enough yourself and in yourself. Serve Jesus and He'll make you good as He wants you to be. He always wants us to be better than we are. So we always have some room for improvement. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and the humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. These things look, man, they're impressive. Boy, they make people like you. You get popular in town and popular in the community, but it doesn't do a hill of beans in the kingdom of God. And so he says, do not get involved in these things that look good on the outside, but all it is is superficiality. And that's almost as bad as the supercast fragilistic expialidocious, you know, I mean, it's just a bunch of hot air, maybe fancy words, but it doesn't do anything. I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity for such a wonderful word, a chapter from God's word. It helps us to be focused on Christ and to be established in Christ. Help us, Lord, to take new courage today in your word and to help many other people Find salvation in Jesus Christ. In His name I pray. Amen. You have been listening to a teaching session from God's Anointed Word from Colossians chapter 2. The session has been entitled, Be Established in Christ. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. You must know Him before you can be rooted, built up, and established in Him. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 